And as promised today, we've got Lauren Bernard from the Brookline Parents Organization. Lauren is a town meeting member. Lauren is, no surprise, a parent. Um, and Lauren has really been instrumental in putting this organization together and getting it started. Lauren, welcome to the show and tell us just what is the BPO? What are we talking about here? Thank you, Tommy. Um, the Brookline Parents Organization is really an organization that on the one hand advocates and on the other hand gives voice to parents who otherwise have not felt like they had much voice. And in some ways you could say those are one and two of the same, but we really see those as different functions. Um, we came together, uh, kind of a disparate group of parents um, who felt at the time that uh, the, our educational priorities were not really happening in the schools. Um, I can give you an example that really kind of gripped me. Uh, I, a parent I met, um, I believe from the Runkel School, and she had a child at BHS and a child at Runkle, and she felt that the educational experience of her, her older child and her much younger child were very, very different. And she started speaking about the educational experience of her older child and that of her younger child. And, and we had a lot of parents in the beginning that were like that, who were saying, why is my younger child getting such a different experience uh, than my older child? And other people saying the opposite, you know, I was much happier with what my, my younger child's getting. So we, we had this kind of group of parents who, who had simply, you know, multiple children who were getting different experiences and weren't satisfied with, with the contrast. So that was one set of people. Um, a, another group of people were very involved in question two, the ballot question two about the cap on charter schools in 2016. And that was kind of a coalescing factor where a number of us were against, uh, were, were, were voting no on question two and felt passionately about it because we felt it was drain, it would drain more money from public education in the state. So that was kind of a coalescing factor as well. And um, a lot of us were worried about the progression of the ed reform movement, the corporate, corporatization of public schools is what a lot of people say, that there was a, you know, an ed reform movement and we felt that our school committee at the time was um, more influenced by the ed reform movement than the not being responsive to the wishes of a lot of parents. So those were sort of some of the factors that, that got us together. Um, and we started after, you know, having meetings, talking, getting to know each other. And uh, that's how we started. And so, you know, you, you coalesced around some combination of national and state educational direction, as well as local concerns. Um, but, uh, you know, no doubt things have evolved over time. And so before we sort of work through some of the things you worked on, there's this great line from a from a movie called Office Space. And the line is, what would you say you do here? <laughs> right, so what does the BP, um, Brooklyn Parents Organization, BPO do? How do they, how do they act? How do they engage with decision makers and, and with the community? Well, um, it takes a lot of different forms. Sometimes it, it comes to us. We get, a, we get an email or a phone call or text from a parent saying, you know, I want to talk about something I've noticed in my, my child's education or what's going on in my child's school. Sometimes um, it comes from us, uh, for example, or and sometimes it's a combination of the two. Sometimes it comes from teachers. Um, one of the things that we got involved in pretty early was um, the whole question of recess. We realized um, that recess was very different at all of the different elementary schools in Brookline. Um, at one school, kindergartners had two 20 minute recesses. Um, another school, uh, kindergartners had like a one 30 minute recess. Uh, another school, there were two recesses up to second grade. It was all over the place. And basically most parents who approached us, this is, this is just an example of how something came to be, um, said, we really want more recess. You know, almost every kid wants more recess. We have parents telling us we want more recess. So that was an example of how um, some parents came to us. We as parents felt our kids weren't getting enough outdoor time. 
And then we actually had teachers uh, who came to, I'll, I can speak for myself, who, who came to me because I work in a school and um, saying, you know, I just don't feel that we're getting enough time outdoors. So some, it's a combination of all those things. So we have a website, brooklineparents.org. We get people who write us. There are people that my co-president, I haven't mentioned Benjamin Kelly, who is the co-president of the Brooklyn Parents Organization. Um, people that we just know, um, people who approach me through town meeting. And then just things that I notice working in a school, for example, other teachers who you know come to us because they know that we can advocate for what we think is best and they think is best for their students. Um, so that's, it's kind of a mishmash of things. Um, it's, it, things come to us and we go after certain things. Um, for example, uh, right, for example, um, we get interested in some of the subcommittee meetings of the, um, of the school committee. We're interested in policy, we're interested in curriculum. Um, and those are things, you know, that kind of we go after. So we are, are a very um, fluid organization in the sense that we have a lot of different actors involved. And sometimes basically something boils to the surface that we all feel is important. And then, you know, we sort of, we, we, make, we, we make an event or we, we, um, we start organizing about something. You mentioned events. My interaction with the BPO has often been through these conversations with the community. And pre-COVID, of course, they were in person. Yes. Right. Now, now maybe they're, they're on Zoom for the time being. Perhaps um, there'll be hybrids in the future. And I remember the, the first one I went to was this conversation about recess. And then there was one a few months later about MCAS testing, which strangely may actually be related. Um, but tell us about how those uh, conversations with the community went and what sorts of people one might expect to see there, guest speakers. How, how did it all come together and how did those first few conversations, uh, how did they feel? So... In November of 2017, we did a an, an event on what you spoke of, the recess, what when we call it whatever happened to recess. Um, and a lot of us had read a book by uh, Dr. Peter Gray, who is a researcher at Boston College, called the Deaf um, uh, Born Free, I believe. Um, be, and well, he, I mix up sometimes his book with his play deficit, deficit disorder. I think is the name. Well, of the that book. was the presentation. Oh, okay. The book actually has a, that's why I'm excited. The book actually has a different name, but um, that was that someone in our group had seen him speak elsewhere and said, wow, this is exactly the kind of thing we're talking about. And we asked him, we contacted him, we asked him and said, could you give us, um, you know, could you, could you do this presentation, um, play deficit disorder, um, a national crisis and how to solve it locally. And we, um, we did it at the library, the, the main library, Hanuman Hall. And uh, that, that came about because like I said, a lot of us were, were concerned about recess and outdoor time for kids. Teachers were talking about it with us as well. And um, one, one, of, uh, the, one BPO person had actually seen him speak and we were interested. And we, we got a really great cross-section of people at that event. That was a very successful event. I, I, can't, I think we had about 60 people and we had uh, teachers, we had parents, some, we had a few kids. Um, we had uh, community members who uh, had an interest in in childhood, early childhood education. Who you know may or may not have been parents, were just community members. I saw a smattering of town meeting members, and um, and we were very pleased with how that first event went. So that kind of gave us a momentum. Um, and we oh, and we had a few high school kids who said who who were who were uh, concerned that they're their siblings were getting more or less recess than they were, which was kind of amusing, but, but it, it turned out to be um, a good event that brought people together. And then you did the MCAS one just uh, several months later. Yes. Yeah, so one of the, one of the things that we've been interested in, and, and a lot of this was born out of the question to the cap on charter schools lifting, you know, that, that was defeated. Um, one which was uh, uh, an initiative backed by the corporate ed reform movement. Another thing, so what came out of that was 
we noticed that a lot of people who were supporting question two were also huge supporters of high stakes testing. Um, on a personal level, I have always disliked high stakes testing from the time I was a student to the, when I was teaching to, you know, as a parent, I just, you know, I think it's, uh, I don't think it's a good thing. And as I, you know, spoke to other people, Ben Kelly felt passionately about it as well. A lot of us felt very passionately about it. And then we were contacted by some educators, not just in Brookline, elsewhere, saying, um, you know, one of the things that's so difficult about high stakes testing, again, I, I use high stakes testing because, you know, in New York, it's the regents. I mean, they have different names. In other states, it's PARC. Here, it's MCAS, is that it forces teachers to get through a certain amount of material by the time the test is given. And so you have this expression, teaching to the test. And I, I saw this play out very, um, very uh, personally. Uh, and I saw, you know, an example, um, kids, for example, in third grade, they're supposed to learn their multiplication tables. And at one point, you know, just like I said, I'm in the school a lot. I had a kid at the time in third grade. Um, they weren't learning their multiplication tables. They, they, they didn't know them, but the, yet they were on division. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how can they be on division if they don't know their multiplication tables? And I went and spoke to the teacher and she said, you know, I would love to spend more time on multiplication. I would say 70% of this class does not know their multiplication tables. And yet I can't, I have to move on because I have to cover a certain amount of material before MCAS hits, before the MCAS is given. You know, I have to cover this material. So that's where I really saw playing before my eyes, this teaching toward the test. And um, a couple of us did some research and we found out uh, that there were some pretty noteworthy advocates against high stake testing. Jeanette Duderman, um, had a grassroots organization that, from Long Island that grew and grew and grew and grew. And now uh, I, I don't know the current number, but at the time that she, she spoke, um, something like 60% of um, Long Island uh, public school kids were not taking the regents. And uh, Professor Ricardo Rosa, who is um, a more local um, academic, he, uh, he also felt that it was an equity issue. Uh, children of color and children from disadvantaged backgrounds simply don't have the opportunity to, um, the questions are geared in such a way that, that they don't have an opportunity to, to really do well on a test like that. So we, we did this event trying to talk about the, in, the inequity of the MCAS and just the kind of pressure it puts on kids, the kind of pressure it puts on teachers. And wouldn't it be nice to find another tool uh, they can act as some kind of standard and not a high stakes test thing. And, you know, so far we still have MCAS, but I think there are more and more people who question whether it's a good thing. And last year we didn't have MCAS. This year it looks, it's, I don't know if it's actually been decided. I heard they were still having MCAS and then I just heard they weren't in certain districts. So it's up in the air because of COVID. And it will be very interesting to see after these two years of, you know, Inter school interruption and different, you know, a different model of school. What happens when we don't have MCAS? Is there, you know, is everything going to come crashing down as, as people have, you know, implied it might. So I think, I think there's, we're going to see, I think we, you know, I personally, I would love to do another event on MCAS post COVID and see, you know, what, what are we left with here? We didn't have MCAS for a year or two. What does that mean? And so the first two events, um, I think, were unquestionably um, stimulated by state and national conversations around yeah. education. Certainly, there was relevance in Brookline, but there was a bigger conversation. Yeah. I think the next two events um, were much more locally focused, right? I think one was um, on kindergarten, making sure there was joy in learning, and then conversations essentially around what do we want out of a superintendent in Brookline given some turnover there. And so your organization uh, very nimbly recognized, hey, we've got some local things. That doesn't mean that these aren't issues that aren't important elsewhere, but these were things that were very hot specifically in Brookline. Exactly. Um, and how, you know, 
I guess the, you know you figure that out because you're talking with other parents and and you know folks talk and drop off and pick up in other times. Um, did the organization have any trouble pivoting to something that was in some ways much more personal, right? It's not abstract when you're talking about your kindergarten teachers and your current and future superintendent. Would you have any trouble with that? Or was that just sort of par for the course? No, we didn't have any trouble with it. Um, so, so many times these things just come out of conversations and the first couple of events, you know, we were talking about national conversation. We were just having, there were, there were these pressing issues in education on a national and, and uh, state level. And, and then um, I think you're right. The next thing was the kind of community conversation with the kindergarten teachers, but that kind of straddled national and um, local because, because their letter made it into the Washington Post. Um, and uh, it was syndicated. And I had a friend that I hadn't spoken to since graduate school, who's a professor in Eugene, Oregon, who called me at Oregon State. And she called me and she said, don't you live in Brookline? <laughs> and I said, yes. And she said, well, I just, I just read this most incredible article and, and, and our public, you know, NPR in uh, the Eugene area just featured this. So, so even though that was a very local event, it got national attention. And, um, I think uh, some of this has its roots a little bit in the in the recess, um, some of its roots in the recess event and the conversations around recess because kindergarten teachers were um, some of the teachers who who came to us very eager for a discussion about recess. And uh, again, and this goes back to sort of the move towards that we we felt was kind of tone deaf with what parents in the district were saying about standardization and, and that sort of thing. And, it, and so it, even though it became a very local and personal um, thing for us, I mean, like my son's kindergarten teacher was involved in this and, 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 and Ben's uh, children's kindergarten teacher was involved in this and, um, and, and others, I mean, and, you know, they wrote this letter basically beseeching um, the school committee and, and the um, central administration, you know, please let's not over academize kindergarten. You know, the children learn by play. Play is very important. And, and the letter was, was poignant. Um, it really resonated with so many people. And um, I, I, so that move, that pivot wasn't difficult at all. And um, we, we jumped on that. Um, and, and we're, we're, it's still, it's, it's, it's a continuing conversation because some, a lot of the things they've asked for, they haven't, they haven't gotten. And that is partially due to all the changes we've had in administration. Um, so I would say it was not difficult to pivot. Um, and, uh, you know, we may pivot back to that because it, like I said, it's a continuing thing. Um, but many parents, uh, were very supportive of that as well. Parent um, that brought that brought a lot of people, a lot more uh, membership, because you know who can disagree with your kid's kindergarten teacher, right? That's, that's right. Well, in fact, I have a, a kid's kindergarten teacher. My daughter is in kindergarten at Pierce School, mm -hmm. and one of the things I've noticed is uh, in in the COVID era, there are substantially fewer conversations between parents, particularly. Right parents who aren't besties, parents who know each other casually, but wouldn't even know each other's phone number, no less necessarily call them on the phone. And one consequence of this is um, there's less of a feel for what the community is thinking about different issues during COVID, Definitely. right? So parents are a little more siloed and a little more isolated and not really sure what everyone else is thinking because Frankly, those conversations that drop off and pick up are less common. Kids are being dropped off and picked up less. Uh, but also these other extracurricular activities and shopping and all of these other things where you would run into parents, right. um, it's not happening. And so can you, BPO has had six conversations in 2020 having something to do with COVID. And so can you talk about the BPO's role in a COVID era um, in supporting parents around all of the changes related to education and COVID. So when we did our first um, 
virtual event, which was um, after the uh, the whole pink slipping uh, event um, this spring, and we called it understanding the moment. You know, it was a very difficult moment. Um, teachers were uh, most of them just kind of temporarily laid off, and and it was it was a hard time. But we thought we we want to do we want to have some clarity because it was a scary time for a lot of parents for kids who understood that they might not see you know, what if i don't see my teacher again that kind of thing and so we wanted to sort of shed light on the situation from both sides of the table and we really initially thought gosh this is such an important question but is anybody going to watch this i mean everybody's so zoomed out, right? Nobody's gonna watch. And, and uh, Ben called me the, um, the, morning, uh, the morning, I think that we sent the first notice out and he said, we have 600 registrations. I said, what? 600 registrations. I said, are you sure? Not 60 registrations? No, 600 registrations. And by the time, and you know, we had gotten a Zoom account for I forget how many, and we had to like up it to the next one. <laughs> And by the time the event took place on May 31st, we had, I believe, close to 1,700 people watching. And then they had to watch through um, YouTube or on Facebook and it was streamed. Um, but my, my, I think the latest tally was we had close to 2,000 people watching that. So that was really interesting for us and, and a little scary because we initially thought, are we going to get anybody because people are so tired of being on Zoom? So, you know, I think there were many factors, but I think one of them is exactly the kind of thing you were hitting on is that people are not running into each other. They're not having discussions at pick up at drop off. If you see someone in the grocery store, it's, you know, you're, you're constantly being reminded, don't linger here, don't linger there. You might not recognize them because they're wearing a mask, right? And it was a way to sort of, even though we weren't necessarily all talking to each other, the chat was interesting because people were having, you know, conversations in the chat as well as putting forth questions. It was a way to just sort of take the temperature of your neighbors, take the temperature of people you normally speak to, as well as the importance of the event. I mean, I can't, you know, ignore that. It was a very important event. And we had, um, a moderator who, although she's local, everybody knows her, Meghna Chakrabarty. So the combination of things, but I think you hit on something is that we've had a better response to all of these Zoom events than we initially anticipated because people are really, it's a, it's a way of connecting, imperfect, but it is a way of connecting. So, um, so that, that sort of, you know, that, that was the one that we got the highest amount of attendance for, you know, apparently it was the highest attendance of any event that the town has seen is what we heard, which was pretty incredible. I, I remember it. In fact, I was one of the guests. Maybe, maybe there's something to it. I'm, maybe. you may not know this, but there are <laughs> tens of thousands of people who watch this show every week. Uh, all over the globe here on Brookline Interactive Group. And so, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. What, um, do you have any sense for what's next? What, you know, what can we expect from the Brookline Parents Organization in 2021? Big dreams, big ideas, anything brewing? Well, I mean, I think, I think uh, what I mentioned before, we're kind of interested to see if, especially if this year, if, if there's no MCAS, you know, to have sort of a, a follow-up I mean, this is, I, I can't speak for the rest of the board, but something I'm interested in would be a follow up to see, well, we didn't have MCAS for a year or two and guess what? The district is still standing. So how, how what, you know, what, what does that mean? Can we get by without these sort of high stakes? So I, I would, I personally would like to see us return and sort of do a, a second run at that. Um, we did this colloquium on great school leadership in December of 2019, which was really exciting and a, a lot of work, really exciting. And we co-sponsored it with Boston University's Wheelock School of Education and Human Development. And we brought in really respected superintendents from all over the East Coast. And we had this terrific um, keynote speaker, Ramon Gonzalez. And um, 
that was very exciting. And we got a sense of, you know, we wanted to really just have people hear and feel what great leadership sounded like. Um, I would love to do another event where we had panels. We're thinking about something big like that, um, especially after COVID and we can do another in-person event. We'd like to do another in-person event with a bang, you know, celebrate the return of the in-person event. Um, I don't know what the subject would be. It could still be something about leadership because we still don't have a superintendent. Um, but uh, there's lots of things. We, the, the event we did on the science of reading got a lot of interest. Uh, we've gotten a lot of people saying, could you do something else? And, you know, like a sequel to, to the whole thing on reading because it was so interesting, brain science. Um, so there's a lot of, we, we're talking about a lot of things. So and, we'll have to stay tuned, right? Brooklineparents.org uh, is maybe the best place. Uh, I know you also have a, an email list. So folks would want to subscribe to the newsletter if they want to hear from the BPO. Um, I have no doubt you're always better. looking for folks to, to be more involved. That's what I'd like to just, if I have just a couple of minutes, is one of the things we really want to do more and more is have representation in each school. And right now we, um, we would love to hear from folks at a couple of schools that we don't have a lot of representation. Uh, Lincoln is one of them. Um, and uh, we could use some more representation from Driscoll. We really want to have a wider representation. South Brookline, I think, is, is not quite as involved as North Brookline. So just a little appeal out there. We're fun people. Come join us. Well, I have no doubt folks will. Uh, Lauren, thank you for joining us uh, on the show today. Thank you, Brookline Interactive Group, for, uh, for showing us, but also, of course, for showing the BPO events. And uh, you've, we've had another great week. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Lauren, thank you for joining me. And we'll see you next week.